Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for our panel on thriving in retirement. My name is Sadie Shernica, and I work in the Alumni Relations Department at the Wisconsin School of Business, and I am delighted to have you joining us today for a really insightful conversation about how you can thrive during this stage in your life. During the next 60 minutes, we'll be hearing from three accomplished business badgers about what their journey into retirement has been like and how they've used these skills honed during their careers to thrive during this time. So before I introduce today's guests, I'd like to share a few upcoming events um, that are exclusive to WSB alumni and then also review today's technology. So first up, um, before the holidays, we have the Business of Cheese on December 14th. The Business of is a really fun event series that we're doing virtually that gives you a sneak peek at the business side of your favorite things, this time being cheese, so fun, so Wisconsin. Um, so we'll be hearing from two business badgers who work for Wisconsin cheese companies. And then after the holidays, our first webinar of 2022 is a goal setting webinar. So this is a great opportunity to get a jump start on your goals in the new year. You can register for both of those events at business.wisc.edu slash alumni slash events. And then I'd also like to go through some of today's technology specifics with you. Um, at the end of the program, we will be doing a Q&A. So to enter your Q&A questions, um, you'll see a little bar at the bottom of your screen for the Q&A box. Um, feel free to submit your questions at any time throughout our presentation, um, and we'll pick a few to ask at the end of the program. Um, this presentation today is being recorded, and we'll be sharing it out with you later in the week, so you can have that and um, go back and watch it if that's more convenient for you then. All righty, so now I'd like to have all my guests join me on screen. Turn those videos and cameras on. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. Hi, hi. All righty. So first we have Nancy Ballsrud, who joins us today from Big Fork, Montana. Nancy had a 33-year career at Cargill in Minneapolis and in Sao Paulo, Brazil, primarily in international finance. Since her retirement, she shifted her time and energy to consulting, nonprofit board management, and guest lecturing. Nancy joined the UW Alumni Association's Board of Directors and helped create Alumni Park, which opened in 2017 here in Madison and currently serves on that planning committee. Um, she is also involved with many other units here at UW Madison. All righty, and then next we have Roger Urban, who's joining us today from Madison. Roger is an accomplished global operating executive with experience in both the public and private sector. He recently retired as president and CEO of Bluemont, a leading government contractor, and was also secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Revenue from 2007 to 2011. Roger stayed busy during his retirement and is actually currently an adjunct associate professor of public affairs at the Robert M. LaFollette School of Public Affairs here at UW-Madison. And finally, we have Ann Schwister, who's tuning in today from Cincinnati, Ohio. Prior to her retirement, Anne um, was a senior executive in global consumer products at Procter & Gamble. In her last role as vice president and CFO for the North American region, Anne was responsible for creating strategies to win in the North American digital and traditional um, retail environment. Anne is currently an advisor and serves on multiple boards, including the Parts ID, chairing the Audit Committee, Pascal, the Greater and the Greater Cincinnati Foundation. Anne is also an emeritus member of the WSB Dean's Advisory Board, as well as the WSB Diversity Advisory Board. Welcome, everybody. Hi, it's great to see you and have, have you on with me today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, all righty. <clears throat> So to get us started, I think a really great kind of intro into this is, can you just tell us what you've been up to? I know those bios weren't inclusive of everything that you've been up to lately. So just what have you been up to in this time in retirement? Um, Anne, let's start with you. Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me today. And it's so fun to get together with a group of badgers and talk about this topic. And I want to start by saying I really don't use the retirement word. Um, I view it as dated. How I see it is all it means is Procter & Gamble liked me enough that they were willing to give me health care benefits for life. 
Um, and I have this cute little gold card that's very 1950s that lets me in the building if I want to go in. Um, but really how I see it is just another phase of my life journey and career. And frankly, the most fun I've had because I only have to do what I want and have a portfolio of options I'm constantly evaluating. So when you reach the point of financial security and everyone needs to define that for themselves, and I realize that's an incredibly privileged thing to have and many thanks to Wisconsin for all the opportunities it gave me, um, you know, you have choices and work provides more than dollars. It provides socialization and challenge um, and fulfillment, and you can decide what's important to you and what you want to do. And as you said, right now, my primary focus is three corporate boards and one not-for-profit. I've also done some consulting. I actually ran the dissolution of my father's structural steel erection business in Milwaukee, which was a huge challenge. It, it had been in business for 49 years. Um, I travel a lot, work out daily, love bar three, play mahjong, love to garden. Um, my spouse, also a badger, is a university professor and just wrapped up a year sabbatical. And we pivoted with COVID, but did a lot of focus on national parks. So it's phenomenal. I also do want to say, though, it is like anything in life when you change, it's a transition. And you need to think through that and take time focusing on the change and the transition and, and just be aware of that. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. Um, Nancy, I'll throw it over to you. Okay. Um, I agree totally. I don't use the word um, retirement. I use graduation. And we're really, a, it's wonderful to get into a new phase of our life where pretty much we can decide how we spend our time, you know, as opposed to previous jobs where other people had a lot of say in what you did. Um, there are three things that I really focused on. First of all, was family. I, I, I traveled internationally two weeks a month for many, many years. And it was just delightful to be able to spend the last couple of years of my kids' uh, high school at home going to some of the activities that I had missed over the years. Um, then we took them to campuses to take a look at what, where they might go to school and then to help them transition to um, their higher education, which was a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> second thing was adventure. Uh, Jim and I, my husband Jim and I are, are real avid travelers. <clears throat> and there were some places in, that were very special that we had not been able to get to just from a time point of view. Um, and some of the memorable ones we, we went on were the ones that the um, Alumni Association had um, planned. And we met just some great people along the way. Just We went to all sorts of just wild places and it was just a lot of fun. Um, and then the third area is volunteerism. And um, I started thinking about my beloved alma mater, University of Wisconsin, and my parents met there, my two brothers met their spouses. So this is really the school of our, of our family. Um, and I just thought I really wanted to, to dive in deeper with, with the university um, and get involved um, in new areas. So I did a little bit of guest lecturing um, at the business school, you know, in my um, crazy international finance and foreign currency risk manager arena, which was interesting. Um, and as you heard, I, I did join the alumni association board. And then back in um, 2014, um, when the alumni association and the UW Foundation um, um, merged, I went onto the board of the UW um, Foundation, which was a very exciting thing. Um, and then later on, um, I um, joined a couple of other boards on, on campus. One is the School of Veterinary Medicine, which humbles me every meeting about the science. Um, and then the newly formed Student Affairs uh, Board of Directors is the other thing that I'm doing. So those are the primary things that I've been doing in my, my 13 years of retirement. Awesome. Thank you. All right, and Roger. Oh, thank you, Sadie. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. I'm glad to be on the on the uh, podcast today, or the video cast today. And uh, I hope you all find this very enriching and, and helpful. Uh, I, um, I I attended several of these types of things before I retired, and it was very yeah. helpful for me to understand what other people were doing, so that I could have some perspective as I retired. I retired only two years ago. Um, I, it was um, it was a it was a tough decision to do. It's a tough decision just to step out and uh, not be part of the flow anymore. And uh, it was the best decision I ever made. I took a complete year off where I didn't really do anything. Well, COVID sort of helped with that, obviously, but I really didn't do much but pursue 
you know, favorite things I like to do music, um, hiking as much as we could do during COVID. Uh, we weren't able to do as much backpacking as we'd like to do, have done, but uh, we've started that, that up now and uh, we'll continue that. We didn't travel, of course, but that's something that is part of our long-term plan. And just finding a way to get to know each other uh, with my my spouse. So just finding ways to get to know each other and to uh, and to experience the world. And you know, as Nancy and Anne have both said, is you know, it's different when you're traveling to Europe or Latin America or Africa. Or, I mean, we I went everywhere in the Middle East uh, for work, as opposed to having time where you really get to know the culture and the people and uh, and the history that you you want to uh, partake in. So. Um, that's 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 our that's my our goals for the future. Um, short term, though, um, you know, when you know, with COVID and just sort of stepping out of the work world, you do feel this void. And the way that I filled it, other than you know, sort of personal uh, enrichment goals, uh, one was to be on boards. I'm on both a corporate board and a not for profit board. I've also, um, as uh, Sadie mentioned, I'm a uh, adjunct at uh, La Follette School. Uh, teach two courses a year and serve on their uh, board of trustees. And um, lastly, just hung my shingle out, uh, uh, consulting shingle, my own, you know, LLC. And um, actually, I will have to say, we could talk more about this, to my surprise, in some ways, uh, joy, but in other ways, uh, uh, maybe, maybe it wasn't so good that uh, I had a lot of interest and I had to decide which uh, clients I was going to take on and which ones I wouldn't be able to take on. And uh, I've probably, I'm on that edge right now where maybe I've taken on too many. Uh, but the, fortunately, there, there's a sequence to, uh, you know, off-ramping some of them. So it gives me a chance to sort of have some lessons learned there and, uh, and then sort of reach that right balance. Yeah, all about balance. It sounds like you are all staying very busy, which is great. Um, Anne and Nancy, I know that you both mentioned um, some boards and your extensive experience on boards. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experiences and like, what would you tell someone who's interested in joining a board and maybe doesn't know where to start? I'll hop in here. Sounds good. Um, my, um focus initially was on, non, on nonprofit boards that I was familiar with. And they were at a point where they were, um, they needed either business or financial acumen on the board to help them move forward. Like an example might be uh, uh, a board was looking at, at buying a new building and the, the people in the, on, the, on the team just really didn't have much experience with that. Um, and I found I was drawn to organizations that were looking for board members that um, were, um, wanted to get into leadership roles. Um, and this, um, for me, that made it more challenging and it helped me to continue to grow as well. Um, so I found that UW-Madison in the, in the end um, seemed to be the place that I felt more, most drawn to. Um, diverse opportunities on campus, um, using my career skills and then, and then learning new areas as well. Um, and just to find out more about parts of the university that I wasn't familiar with, um, like, like the School of Veterinary Medicine, as an example. And if, if you do want to consider going on to a board, I've got just a couple things that I thought I would share with you. Um, do you want to use your career skills exclusively, or would you like to try to take on something that's in a different field entirely? Um, look at the caliber of the organization that you're considering to join. I mean, is it a... Is it a um, a healthy board, is it a one that where the organization is strong, has good leadership, or are there significant challenges and, and, and problems? And that doesn't mean that you want to run away from the problems, but just knowing what the scenario is, is I think a really important thing. Um, I also thought it was really important too to, to find out whether board members had um, a meaningful role in the, in the governance of the, um, the entity, or do they just have a board because it says so in their bylaws that they have to have one? Um, but in general, I just think it's really good just to start small, you know, um, get your um, foot in the door and sort of perhaps as a member of the board. And then, you know, you can move on to um, um, taking on more responsibilities or um, um, sharing other little pieces within the organization as well. So, um, it's, you know, and one, one nice thing about this is that um, it's sort of like dating. If it doesn't fit, it's just fine to, to walk away. 
So, yeah, that's such a good way to look at it. It's okay if it's not for you. It's just, you know, good to get out there and get your right. feet wet. Right. Those are great points, Nancy. And maybe I can add on a little bit of corporate board as well. I had done already, I'd been on the Wisconsin uh, Business School Advisory Board, Diversity and Inclusion. I was on the board of the Greater Cincinnati Foundation. And as I was retiring, I really wanted the experience of a corporate board. I felt like it was sort of the capstone to, to my business career to see business from that side. And I have to tell you, getting my first corporate board seat is one of the hardest goals I've ever had to work to achieve, which shocked me. Um, but it required lots of networking with friends in C-suite jobs, on boards, and some recruiters. And about the time I was about to give it up and say, you know what, not, not going to happen, that's okay, other things, um, I got one. And uh, it was basically via, um, actually via a mentor, mentor of mine from Wisconsin who had referred me to someone. Um, and, but then once you get one, you kind of have the seal of approval and people know you can do it. And then I very quickly got two more. Mm. Um, so, and I'm really enjoying it because it does give you that governance perspective. It gives you a new way to think about business um, and with the size of the companies whose board I'm on, you can do a bit of advising as well, which is nice. Um, so if you're interested in that, I think you really have to think through what you have to offer. Um, CEOs want people who have similar C-suite experiences and can really help and advise them. So I really leverage my finance and accounting background. I'm an audit committee financial expert my consumer products and my international, but you need to get really clear on what your value proposition will be to them. And then I also took classes to learn more about what it meant to be a corporate board director. And Stanford has a rock governance institute that I did. The National Association of Corporate Directors does stuff. We have in Cincinnati, a women's director network. So I started getting familiar with the work um, and then I also would suggest finding a mentor who maybe has similar skills to you. I connected with a, a, a former CFO, female CFO, who had reached her fill, kind of had her portfolio of boards, so was willing to sort of send to me other recruiters who came with options for her. And if, if the skill sets are similar, it works kind of nicely. Um, so that was a good tip. And the other thing to know about boards is fit is a big piece. They don't have that many seats. People stay on them for a long time and they're trying to create a matrix of skills. So it's not just about an open seat. It's about an open seat that they want finance skills in or whatever. So you just have to really be patient. Um, so those were my tips there. Awesome. Thank you. Roger, anything to add from your point of view? No, I think I think um, I think Ann and Nancy hit on hit it right on the the the, the nail on the head that uh, it's a process of uh, of um, uh, you know uh, finding that network that has those opportunities. I, I would actually I would actually suggest that you do not rely on the the, the recruiting firms for finding a position. I, I think a lot of people do that. I think it's a waste of time. Uh, it's really about expanding your network, finding uh, mentors or advisors who can help you get those uh, positions and then find on the board, uh, only take a position within your core competency. Don't, don't take anything outside of that. I'm like uh, Ann, I, I'm on the audit committee uh, of both organizations. And that has actually been, that's just a place where I, I do the best. So, uh, so once you're on, you know, find that place where you can be most effective. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Roger, I know that you had talked a little bit about your experience teaching. Um, can you tell us a bit about your experience and if someone was interested in exploring that, where might they start? Oh, great. Well, for me, you know, my pathway there was a little unusual. Uh, I, I received my, um, my executive MBA at the, at UW and, uh, I was sort of familiar, I, I got to be 
friends with uh, the the dean at the time and uh, and and his predecessor, and uh, I found myself uh, just finding ways to engage uh, engage the the school through mentorships and and those type of things. And uh, an opportunity came up where all of a sudden someone uh, was relieved, and they were looking for someone to teach a course, and they wanted somebody with practical experience because I'd already engaged the school. They came to me and asked me if I was interested in doing it, and uh, I agreed to do it. But and, and I was doing it while I was working, so. The great thing is it was the executive and evening MBA. So I didn't have to worry about a conflict with work per se, uh, unless I was traveling, then it was, could be an issue. But uh, I, you know, stuck my foot in there and, and was able to over 10 years build a program uh, that, um, that didn't really exist at other schools, but uh, now it's, it's more, more prevalent at, at business schools, of course, in leadership communications and, uh, sort of had, you know, mixture of strategy and operations and all that in it. It was sort of a hybrid course. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed it. Towards the end of the 10 the year period, though, I was working, uh, I was coming close to deciding to retire. And it was, there was a lot going on in the organization. So I really couldn't, um, I really couldn't sustain my obligation there. So after 10 years, I left. And in retirement, uh, the, the La Follette School came up to me and asked me if I was interested in sort of pursuing a, a course um, in, 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 along the same lines, but also think about uh, a second part of the course, which is strategic management. So, so I looked into it and decided to do that. And I, this is my first semester teaching and uh, it was a great experience and it's something that I would urge people to do. However, I do have some caveats that I'd like to uh, talk about because I think it's a, it's a, it's, I, I, I've met a lot of people that want to do this. I've met a lot of people that have done this and there's a great many of those that did it for one semester and didn't do it anymore mm -hmm. because it isn't like what you think it is. It's a, uh, it's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of pressure. You have, you know, you have the responsibility to manage these students and to ensure that they're enriched and that they get something, you know, uh, long term out of the program. And, uh, and, you know, that's just not something for everyone. So a lot of people, you know, sort of try it and then pass on it. Uh, what are some things that I think are important? Number one, same as boards, right fit. It's got to be the right fit. Certainly start with your, um, either your uh, of affiliation with the UW program or uh, a local university, uh, find your, you know, identify what your core competency is and what you, you know, what can, how can you scale uh, the, that, that experience into a course. Uh, the pedagogical platform is something that's obviously when you're teaching, that's, that's the whole point of it. So for some people um, it's more natural for other people, you 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 know, if you've done training at your companies or whatever, that's it's something like that. Uh, but there's also programs that you can go to um, outside of school to learn how to become a, a, an effective teacher. Uh, you have to sort of really make sure it's in your personality mix. Uh, you have to be able to take the pressure of preparation. Preparation is a huge part of this. That was one thing that I uh, I didn't realize. It takes a long time because you're essentially dealing with with most of these courses. Unless it's a you know unless it's a classical course, you have to design the course. You have to figure out what's the content you're going to use. Uh, is this content that the that the uh, the students can can learn from? Um, is it relevant to what's going on in the market today? And, uh, and then uh, can you effectively turn that into a learning platform? Um, prep time is, uh, is the key. Do not underestimate, if you decide to do this, do not underestimate uh, your prep time. Um, I would say, uh, you know, that includes the syllabus. Uh, you know, it's good. You can find templates out there for most syllabus, but make sure that you have uh, you, you've got good sources for it. Uh, you, you can you can set up for affinity groups around other universities where people are teaching similar courses, and you know, gather information and from from those folks to help you um, grow and learn for yourself uh, how to teach. Um, Keep in mind that you're teaching young minds and they're not going to be like the people that uh, even the young people in your companies, they're, they're, they, they do not have any idea what work is like. And so you sort of have to have that way of, of which you can, you know, connect with them. Um, and um, 
Lastly, uh, which is other than setting your, your whole program up is you have to keep the content fresh mm -hmm. uh, because they're mm -hmm. online all the time. They really are, they're engaged. They know what's going on. They'll, they'll research what you, what you impart to them in class and you really have to sort of be on the ball and, uh, and, to, and to keep the content fresh. And if you do those things and if you like it after a year or so, then you sort of have a platform to continue to go on, uh, to build on, sorry, and, uh, and to be really good at it. But it's not for everybody, but I would recommend trying it. It's worth the experience. If nothing else, you learn, for, you learn yourself. You learn, you learn about yourself and about, um, about the, 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 the content that you're, you're teaching. And um, it's, a growth, it's a growth experience in and of itself. Absolutely. Out of, I, I have a couple of builds on what Roger said. I completely agree, Roger. And I thought that I would want to do teaching and investigated it. And it's still on my list of portfolio of ideas. I might come back to it. But I chose not to do it because flexibility was too important to me. And you have to remember, like, if you're a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, you need to be there Monday, Wednesday, Friday. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, so, so you have to think through that the students are depending on you, but a good way to get some of the flavor and the benefits of teaching without quite all the investment that Roger's saying is to do guest lectures, connect with professors who teach topics you like. I have done one at University of Dayton on uh, entrepreneurialism and actually talking about the dissolution of my father's business. And I love doing it. I do it every year. And that's nowhere near the time investment. You can also do club presentations. Um, so reach out to Wisconsin, to universities in your area, and you can do things like that and get a bit of the joy without all the investment. Yeah, I left that out. That's actually important. I, it was on my list and for some reason I missed it. But yeah, guest lecturing is absolutely the best way to find out if you're if you've got the right personality to do that, uh, you could do that either at the class level or, you know, most universities, most business schools like uh, UW have guest lecturers that come and speak to the variety of class structures, uh, the undergraduates, the, the graduate courses, the evening exec, you know, whatever it is, they'll come together um, for, for the event and it gives you a good idea to understand whether this is something that you think is, is in your future or not. Awesome. Thank you. Nancy, anything on your end? Would you no, like that? I, I, you know, I, I guess lecturing is definitely what I was most interested in too, just because of the time commitment, like Anne said, you know, and um, <clears throat> I, I very much wanted to be able to um, decide um, in advance how much time I wanted to spend on anything in particular. Mm -hmm. So like the guests just fit much better for me. Right. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I think it's really interesting to kind of see those benefits and maybe like the not so benefits of the um, of both. It sounds really um, interesting. Um, thank you all for that. That's like super great. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit over to mentoring and what that has looked like um, during this stage of your life. I think we touched on it a little bit at the beginning. Um, how have you continued to give your time and expertise through mentoring and what would you suggest to people when they are getting started or how to get started? I, mean, I think it's very important. Uh, you know, uh, uh, students are looking for you know, students and young professionals are looking for mentors all the time, is just really how do you find those uh, mentor opportunities? Uh, certainly, you know, uh, there are plenty of organizations uh, out there, community organizations, where you can identify a mentee. Uh, corporations, companies are looking for mentors. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're outside the company, not always uh, that's mm -hmm. the case, but certainly if you're still at a company, mentor there, and it gives you the experience so when you retire, you have the ability to be good at it. Um, I think you have to really think about if it's the best fit for you. Uh, once again, that uh, that it's you know it's, it's it can be a short term commitment, but most likely it's at least a you know for a few year commitment, a few years commitment, and uh, maybe even a longer term than that. Uh, you have to find the right personalities to work with, and I think you have to think about things like. Um, you know, do, do you, uh, what's the, what's the parameters of your mentor, mentor relationship? 
Is this going to be sort of, you know, like once a month, you know, every week? How are you going to do that? Uh, how long? Is it going to be a year or two? Um, what's wh what exactly are you going to mentor them on? And then, um, and then, you know, it may turn into a lifetime relationship, a friendship, uh, or it may just be a short term thing. It, it really depends on what you're looking for, what the, what the mentee is looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll hop in. I, uh, one thing that I found that's been so um, wonderful in my retirement is to um, uh, work with some of the people that reported to me um, at Cargill and, you know, very diverse backgrounds, different countries, et cetera. And um, in, in addition to helping them, it really helps me keep in touch with, with what's going on at that company. It's privately held, so you don't get a lot of information. So um, it's, I, you know, I really get something from that as well as giving. And I'm, Really happy to say that a woman <clears throat> that I brought into my team, Treasury at Cargill, um, was just named the, the, the first female um, treasurer of the company. So I'm just, you know, just ecstatic about that. Wow. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Nancy, I do similar. I still continue to mentor several of my mentees from Procter and Gamble, mm -hmm. and I get the same kind of joy from it. Mm -hmm. um, I also coach a few executives at my companies. Obviously, you know, I'm audit committee chair, so very often you end up coaching the CFO. Um, but also on the Greater Cincinnati Foundation, I coach uh, one of the executives on strategic planning. So that's been rewarding, and it twists your brain different ways. I also work with an organization in Cincinnati called Flywheel, which is a social enterprise incubator. And we do office hours where you can meet with people who are starting up social enterprises and help them on a variety of topics. And I find that fun and it, you know, fast cycle, you see if it clicks, if it doesn't, you move on. So I really enjoy that as well. Um, the other thing with mentoring too is I find that you have to be very careful to think about what you're doing yourself to get mentoring. So I've been very cognizant of making sure I have a network of people who serve on corporate boards, people who do some of the philanthropic work I like, things like that, and, and make a point to continue building my network as well and make sure I'm getting input and advice that I need. That's a great piece of advice. Do you feel like with the networking piece that it takes more effort than maybe it would back when you were in your regular career time or? I think in the beginning it did take more as mm -hmm. I was figuring out corporate boards and things like that. I had to yeah. reach out and build some new relationships. But now that I've done that, it's probably about the same. I just have to consciously make sure I'm connecting with people. Yep. Absolutely. I think that makes sense. And something that I, you know, still am doing myself, just making sure that you're consciously thinking about it. It's a great piece of advice. Okay. Well, COVID and, doesn't help, obviously. <laughs> oh, gosh, I know. True. You got to really rely on LinkedIn or, you know, Zoom or whatever that looks like for you. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Totally. Okay. Um, then it's kind of switching gears. I know, Roger, you had kind of touched on this a little bit um, when talking about teaching, but I want to talk about how um, during this time, you know, things may seem like they might slow down, but often that is not the case and things can actually get busier. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, you want to still make sure you're having that time to relax, take time for yourself. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how you manage your time and what that looks like? Well, I'm going to be the first one to say I'm probably not managing my time the best I could right now. It's a learning curve. <laughs> it's a learning curve, exactly. You know, you know, the great thing is, is you can be, uh, both uh, Anne and Nancy mentioned this, you can be very helpful to organizations, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, especially, especially in private sector companies, because now you're on the outside, you're looking in, you know, you've got that experience. Uh, some of these companies may have a vacuum of experience and you can sort of come in there and help them do things differently, help them learn, uh, help them, you know, find a, find a better place in the market, whatever. Uh, and so, and it, you know, and you're, 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 you're a little bit freer to, to discuss um, issues with, uh, with, with executives at the organization. So that's, that's sort of what I, what I've been able to do is sort of my hanging my shingle out is that I can come in as a, as a external consultant 
someone, especially in the, the markets that I worked in and provide, uh, provide good, good advice for them. And, um, and then, you know, uh, punch out, uh, you know, it's success breeds <laughs> more opportunities, obviously. And then you get more people coming in, you know, you just have to sort of, you know, first priority is yourself. Uh, you know, how much do you want to do? How much do you want to spend, um, you know, enriching your own self and doing the things that you had planned to do in retirement? And then think about uh, the other opportunities. And you just have to say no a lot of the times. Uh, otherwise, you will, go, you will go over the edge. So mm -hmm. um, luckily for me, you know, I've got this crescendo uh, or what's the declining base of work that's going to, you know, be ending here in the next six months. And then I, the next the next group of clients I'll do a little bit better about uh, about spending my time. But, uh, you know, it's good. It's good to do consulting. It keeps you in the game. Uh, if you do that along with board work and, you know, by the way, you have to watch that conflict, too. I mean, if you take a consult, you have to make sure there's no board conflict. Uh, but it gives you keeps you in the game and keeps you fresh. It also can be helpful to your teaching um, experience. And so uh, so, you know, it's another good thing to do. It's just. Like everything, it's time management and prioritization. I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, from the board perspective in terms of time management. I think it's a really important thing to address with the um, leadership there before you join. You know, things like uh, how many board meetings are there per year? Um, what are the <clears throat> committee um, responsibilities and assignments and you know expectations? Um, how much travel is involved? Um, generally. Um, um, and the nonprofits, you, you pick up your own tab for the, for the travel, and that's something to consider. Um, and, um, you know, and again, don't overcommit to too many at the same time, you know, just really, you know, step by step. Um, and I would say if, if you sense that it's not a fit, you thought this organization was something you were interested in and you get on it and it's just not, um, it's just very, very okay to say, you know, and I've got other opportunities or whatever. Thank you for this opportunity. Or you can stay a member of the board and not necessarily get into like um, heading up a committee that would be take more time. <clears throat> and um, I, I um, came up with a phrase to, to, to um, respectfully um, say, no, I'm not interested. So this, I'm gonna read it to you. My current schedule doesn't give me the time to fully commit to this opportunity. Thank you so much for considering me. You wanna do it in a positive way but you've got to do what's right for you, so. Totally, I think everyone should write that down, steal it because that <laughs> is perfect. And anything on your end? I, I love both your ideas, Roger and Nancy, and your phrase is perfect, I'm writing that down. It's about, it, it's about exactly what Roger said. You got to get really clear on what's important to you and then making sure you're shaping your day around that. And if you don't enjoy it, say no. Like every once in a while, I'll find myself being like, I don't want to do this. I'm like, well, why am I? Yes. <laughs> no, don't. And I also think, remember, it's not like you have to do everything at one time. I have a little Word document in my computer of all the ideas, my entire portfolio of things that I might be interested in. You don't have to do them all at once. And it's about managing that portfolio to know if something's rolling off, do I want to add something on? Um, and actually, a phrase will work, Nancy, because you could come back to some of them and say, I now do have time in my schedule. Mm -hmm. And I'll mm -hmm. tell you one, this coming year, 2022, will be my ninth year on the Greater Cincinnati Foundation Board, and I will term limit out. And I'm really going to use the next year and have already mm -hmm. been setting up with some of my network that I'm thinking about what are, I want a not-for-profit board. I'm thinking through what are the criteria I want and I'm gonna actually research several and then make a decision because I'll take one new one, but then I'll be back to Nancy's sentence of my current schedule doesn't allow. Mm -hmm. um, so, so think through that too. It's a portfolio. It's not everything at once. The other thing I talked about in the beginning that I want to come back to too is the transition into retirement is hard or can be hard. And I'll tell you the thing that sort of jarred me in the beginning is I was used to having a title, right? I was the CFO of North America for Procter and Gamble. And in those first couple months, people would say, well, what do you do? Like, and, and there was kind of this 
like you must be sitting around watching TV all day, or you must have time to do all kinds of, and, and you have to kind of pick yourself up and have a line. I, I like your line, Nancy, of I graduated, or I am so fortunate I'm defining a new career, but you have to have kind of your line that sure. you say mm -hmm. and you do, and then be really aware it's a transition. And actually, as I was preparing for this, I was looking back through some of my files and I found this book, I, I have nothing to do with it, but it's called Retirement Transition and an Innovation Ooh. Approach. I, I looked this weekend, still available on Amazon, um, written by Patricia West Doyle, who was a P&G R&D research and development leader. And she doesn't do the financial side of it. She does the really thinking about what your values are, where you wanna spend time, um, and how she would have done innovating a new project product for PhD. So it's actually, I found it a worthwhile, mm -hmm. easy read to help focus on that. And it was fun actually this weekend to pull it back out. I'm like, oh, I forgot a couple of these things. So, but, but really do, it's a transition. I like Roger's idea, say no for a while, just, just sink it in and let it sink in. Mm -hmm. It's all important. Yeah, it's kind of like you need to get used to it first and then decide what your priorities are going to be. And that seems like a great resource, that book. So um, thank you for sharing that. Um, and just a reminder to everybody, if you have any questions, um, make sure you're dropping those in the Q&A box down in the bar below um, in the Zoom box. Um, and so I want to get one more question in before we do start the Q&A. Um, We've been talking all about volunteering and kind of using um, our skills from career into this time, but I want to talk a little bit about personal enrichment as well and what personal enrichment you've found um, valuable during this time. So how do you um, find time for yourself to benefit you? And then what do you suggest to those who are maybe like struggling to do so or don't necessarily know where to start? <laughs> Uh, well, I'll go first. Um, I, I think the most enriching thing that I've been doing is uh, uh, getting connected with friends and family, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where I can do it pretty much anytime I want to do it. And uh, I can travel to see them. It, it can have longer, longer stints of, uh, you know, of, of time to, to rebuild those relationships, even including my, re my relationship within my own house. Uh, you know, uh, I have time to do those kinds of things. So I think from a you know, from a, a, a spiritual standpoint, that to me has been the best thing. Obviously, physical exercise is, is one that's important as well. And, um, and lastly, it's, you know, the, the, the hobbies and things that I like, uh, you can see I have records behind me. So music is an important <laughs> part of my life. So, uh, so that, that, that's, that's probably the, 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 the other thing that I do. Those are some really good ones, Roger. Um, I just have found that if, if, if you find a role in an organization that really just resonates with you, it's just pure joy. And um, it's really good for the soul as well. You know, and I've, I've been on some um, early childhood development uh, boards in the Minneapolis area. And there's just something so special about, you know, seeing um, the, the, um, the path that somebody's going to take change because of something that you might have contributed to. That's just priceless. Um, another thing that I found was interesting when you when you go on to these um, boards, you meet really interesting people, and um, you actually can create friendships at this stage of your life that are meaningful, um, especially you know if they're um, uh, a kindred spirit. And we've got um, some great friends that we've made in, in retirement. Um, and then I guess finally, I would say that um, you know leaving a career gives you um, uh, the gift of unstructured time, and you really get to author how it's used and. I would just say, do with it what makes you happy and what makes you fulfilled. Hmm, I love that. And anything on your end? I think Roger and Nancy covered it. That was well said, you too. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. That was wonderful. And I think it's just really important, you know, to remind ourselves that this time is for, you know, self-enrichment. So mm -hmm. making sure you spend that time for that. Um, okay, well, I want to get into our Q&A time now. So if you have not, make sure that you are dropping your questions in the Q&A box, but we'll get started. Um, the first question I'm going to do is from Georgette. Um, in seeking a corporate board appointment, how important is it to live near the corporate headquarters? 
And do you have any thoughts on that? It probably depends on the size of the corporation. In my case, I don't live near either of my three corporate boards and they pay the travel for me to go. I um, mean, obviously with COVID, a lot has been on Zoom. Right. Yep. That's also probably good to note that a lot of, you know, opportunities have come up in that space with being able to remote in. So that's kind of nice. There's nothing like having a meeting in person is there, you know? Oh, I know. Um, especially <laughs> to build those relationships that, that are so such a wonderful part of those um, opportunities. So um, Zoom Absolutely. is fine, but it's, it, there's just something that... Right. Is Second there. option. Number yeah. one is yeah. in person. <laughs> yeah. I think it's pretty rare to live near your board. I think most people are traveling these days to boards. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there's people enjoy their, I mean, I think it's important to have that regional diversity as well as the talent diversity on the board. And I just don't think you're gonna get that at one location. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, awesome. Um, next question from Molly. Did any of you do board work while you were working? Um, and would you recommend starting before retirement, before leaving a company? Um, or not? I can take that. I did not-for-profit board work before I left uh, Procter & Gamble, and I'm glad I did. I think it gave me an idea of what it was like, what it was about. Um, it was not an option for me to do corporate board work. It actually is nice. As I said, getting your first board seat, corporate board seat can be hard, so it could be nice if you were able to get one before you uh, retire, it could be a nice way to start, but not necessary. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of um, local things with United Way <clears throat> and um, um, a place called the Greater Minneapolis um, Childhood um, Nursery where um, families that are in distress can drop their kids off for 72 hours. And that was one where you had volunteer opportunities as well as leadership things. That was, that's why I did that. It was encouraged by my company to, to support United Way and what, what kind of opportunities they, they brought to me. So it was good. Awesome. Well, I broke protocol and answered <laughs> and wrote an answer down, which <laughs> I thought it was to me, but, uh, uh, you know, I said no, but I actually did serve on not for, I was, I was thinking of for-profit, but I did serve on not-for-profit boards as well, because it gives you a good, uh, good experience, what it's like to be on a board. And, um, and oh, so sure. that, you know, that was helpful. Of course I was on, I was ex officio on my own board. Uh, so, so that, that was a, that was a good experience on the, on the for-profit side. Awesome. Um, you talked a lot about networking um, to get these opportunities and that's kind of how you get your way in there. Any tips for people on networking? Best, best tips you found? Don't cold call. <laughs> <laughs> Those days are over. <laughs> well, Andy, you've done way. so much of it. Um, I would love to hear what you have to say about um, that question. Yeah, you know, to me, it was just thinking through my network and who would have things to offer and sending mm -hmm. an email, sending a text, you know, buying a coffee and then truly listening to what they had to say and mm. thanking them and following up and all the usual things. So, um, and then in some cases, some people I knew were willing to refer me to other people. So it was continuing mm -hmm. to follow up on those leads. Right. Awesome. I think coming back to, uh, I mean, coming back to the whole, you know, issue of board experience, that certainly is a a way to network, um, uh, you know, community organizations, um, you know, Rotary Club, all those kinds of things. Uh, Ann and I met through uh, the board of the board of trustees at the business school. So, um, so that that's you know, it goes back mm -hmm. to the whole volunteer voluntary aspect of retirement. Uh, that's those are all network platforms for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Awesome. Um, okay. I'm thinking one more question. Oh, it's for Anne. Anne, could you share that name of the book again and the author? <laughs> it's a great resource, everyone. Write it down. <laughs> sure. And again, I have nothing to do with this. It's just one that I use, used. It was called Retirement Transition, an Innovation Approach. And it's written by Patricia West Doyle. Wonderful. And I know at least on Saturday, it was available on Amazon. <laughs> 
Perfect. <laughs> and I'm well with some of these. <laughs> awesome. So retirement transition and innovation approach, Patricia West Doyle. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think that wraps it up for today. I don't really, I think we've gone through all of our questions. So thank you all so much for being here today. This has been such a great conversation. And I really do think that these insights and um, nuggets have been so helpful. And I think that people are really going to take those and hopefully run with them. Um, this is just a reminder that today's presentation was recorded. Um, so we will be sending out a link to you with the presentation, a recap, and then also a satisfaction survey about your experience today. So please fill that out if you have a couple of minutes later this week, that would be great. But other than that, that's all I have. Um, Nancy, Roger, Anne, thank you so much for being here today. This has been pleasure. great. Pleasure. pleasure. Thanks for having us, Sadie. You so bet. On all righty, well, we'll talk soon. Go Badgers. All right. Go Badgers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.